All right, welcome. Thanks for being here this afternoon um, for our Capstone Student Talks. Capstone is a unique class offered to seniors where they get to choose a topic, something that they're interested in, and then they work with that same topic all semester. So they have to choose their topic, which takes quite a while. They do a lot of research. They write a research paper. They create a project. And then the last component of the class is to give a talk to the community to explain what they've learned over the course of the last four months. And so that talk is what you are at today. So thank you for coming and supporting the three ladies who are speaking this afternoon. They each have really interesting and I think very relevant things to say to us as a community today. Um, if you didn't get a chance to on your way in, on your way out, you can look at some of the projects that are on the table in the back that the girls will also be referencing in their presentation. So Jairu is going to start us off this afternoon. Hi, I'm Jaru. Today, technology is all around us. Technology is so powerful, so mesmerizing, so eye-opening. Robots, machine learning, and uh, artificial intelligence have improved many sectors and our standard of living. Technology is advancing so rapidly. It is being created, improved, then improved again at a faster rate than ever. But let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves, are we using our technology effectively? Next slide. Picture yourself in a restaurant. You order your food and you're waiting, hungry for that first bite. But you're also bored. What is your first reaction? You pull out your phone for some entertainment such as YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and you scroll away. At least I would. Almost everyone today, and I believe almost everyone here today, uses social media to post your daily lives, maintain relationships, or even promote products. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, it is concerning how much time social media has taken away from us. Next slide. According to Dr. Rosen, sorry, according to Forbes advisor, an average person spends about 2.5 hours on social media every day. Astonishingly, if an average person maintains this usage for, five, for 73 years, the end result is 5.7 years spent in social media. Imagine what more we could have done if we had just spent one less year on social media. Social media and technology are made to assist us, but it has become such a major distraction in many lives, and admittedly, also my life. In the middle of finishing up an assignment, I would find myself checking my phones even when there's no notif notification. While sitting in the car with nothing else to do, I relied on my phone for entertainment. While doing something on my computer, I would unconsciously pull up YouTube for a break. It made me wonder, why are we so hooked up on technology? One of, according to Dr. Rosen, a research psychologist, the first of the many reasons we rely so much on technology is anxiety. Uh, next slide. In one of her colleague Shiver's studies, Shiver ask the participants to turn off their phones and spend one hour doing nothing. Light smartphone users' level of anxiety were relatively low and steady throughout, but moderate and high smartphone users were anxious after 30 and 10 minutes, respectively. This study shows that technology can make us so dependent on it that without it, we would feel anxious. The second reason is that technology makes us crave more of it. In another study, Shiver asked the lets the participants watch a video. 
she places the participants' phones a few feet behind them. Note that the participants were close enough to hear the messages signaling, the alert signaling that the messages were arriving, but they couldn't read it. Shiver then sends a series of messages to them. The result was, was that each text was met with an instant spike in arousal which means each text that was sent was met with some excitement by the participants. This arousal is also very similar to dopamine, where it would make our brain crave more and more of it, because we want that excitement again and again, which is why we are so distracted by the technology around us. Is this constant, constant distraction by technology what we call a lack of attention span. It's been about four minutes, and I'm pretty sure half of you have zoned out already, due to a lack of attention span. And how many times have you looked at your phone throughout? Therefore, this brings me to my main topic, your attention span. According to Oxford Languages, Attention span is the length of time for which a person is able to concentrate on a particular activity or subject. Attention, focus, and concentration often correlate with productivity. In fact, to be more productive, you need to focus. Focus is the ability to concentrate on a single point or task. A person who can focus well at work can channel all of their attention and energy into their work. Therefore, a person who can channel all of their attention and energy well into their work can finish their work faster, become more productive, and contribute, to the, contribute more to the society. Therefore, having enough attention span is important to thrive in such a highly demanding world today. As technology, becomes, as technology has become such a big part of our lives, You've probably heard things like short attention span or our attention span is shorter than a goldfish. In 2015, an article with, um, with the headline, you now have a shorter attention span than a goldfish, was published in the Times Magazine. In the article, it stated that an average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. An hour, humans' average attention span dropped from 12 to 8 seconds. A few years later, in response to this article in 2017, Simon Mabin from the BBC News revealed that these stats did not come from Microsoft. Instead, it came from another source, Statistic Brain. When he tried to contact the listed sources, such as the National Center for Biotechnology and the Associated Press, he couldn't find any research backing up these stats. Furthermore, there's no evidence that goldfish have an attention span, a nine-second attention span. Maybe at this point, we are just looking down on them. Maybe success in debunking our diminishing attention span suggests that there's a lack of long-term studies that tell whether or not our attention span have actually declined or not. However, I do think that there is at least a public perception that our ability to concentrate has worsened. Therefore, appropriate measures should be taken to at least improve or maintain our attention span. We all want to enjoy life because we all want to be connected, because we want to enjoy life, maintain relationships, and work on our jobs. I know what you're all thinking now. Yes, you're all correct. We can just throw our phones into the bin or turn off all of our notifications just to increase our attention span. But there are a few things we can do to maintain or improve our attention span. First, it's deep work. Recently, Carl Newport's book, Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in the Distracted World, has gained much attention and has become one of my personal favorite books. In his book, Newport describes that most people today do shallow work, 
which are non-cognitively demanding and are easily replicated by your peers or even AI. Shallow work are often done while being distracted and often create not much value in the world. For example, think, of, think back to the time while you were being distracted by a WhatsApp notification or a Teams notification or an email to notification while you're working. Well, that's probably the shallow work you're working on. Instead, Newport encourages us to do something called deep work. What is deep work? Deep work are professional activities performed in a state of distraction-free concentration that pushes your cognitive capabilities to their limit. There are many ways to apply deep work, such as creating rituals by scheduling where, when, and how long you'll work, and prioritizing when you will apply deep work versus shallow work. When you successfully apply deep work, you can put full concentration on your task, thereby enhancing both your attention span and your productivity. Feel free to read the book to learn more. Next, Kaplan's attention restoration theory, ART suggests that mental fatigue and concentration can be improved by time spent in or looking at nature. In a journal article by Andreas and Francis, one of the tenets of this theory is that different environments can have different effects on attention. To prove this theory, Taylor and Kuo did a study on children 7 to 12 years old, who were professionally diagnosed with ADHD. In the study, the children experienced three different types of environments, a city park and two other well-kept urban settings via ind individually guided 20-minute walks. Using digit span concentration, this digit span backward, a concentration measurement, the study found that children felt concentrated better after walking after the park walk than the downtown walk or the neighborhood walk. Furthermore, the study concluded that 20 minutes was enough to increase the attention performance of the ADHD children. And you may ask, why is this important if you do not have ADHD? Well, study suggest, the study suggests that the potential of nature to enhance our attention performance extends to the general population, not just within the ADHD population. Lastly, using specific types of attention, such as selective and sustained attention, can help you improve your attention span. The American Psychological Association describes sustained attention as attentional focus on a task, on a stimuli in the environment while ignoring the other. And, sorry, that was selective attention. Sustained attention is the attentional focus to, fo to concentrate on the task for a period of time. For example, you are all practicing it right now. You are all doing one specific task, listening to me and the other speakers for an extended period of time, 45 minutes. To further improve your ability to apply these two types of attention, activities such, such as chess, board games, or Sudoku can help improve your ability to concentrate. For instance, studies show that chess helps players improve their concentration level, level and memory power. Regular practice, such as working through chess puzzles, can help people improve their concentration, among many other benefits. In my opinion, activities that are concentration intensive can help children improve their attention span in the long term. And I recommend parents and teachers to involve their children in such activities in hopes that their attention span will at least be maintain maintained or improved in the long term. For, for example, um, with the help of Ms. Tay and Mrs. Anderson, I was able to create a list of activities that were short, fun, and required concentration that elementary teachers could use in, hope that, in hopes that their students' attention span would at least maintain in the long term. And there were many different kinds of activities 
that are suitable for a wide range of ages. Therefore, take a stroll in the park for 20 minutes today. Try pushing your cognitive capabilities to their limit while working on your work today, or go to chess.com and play a few puzzles. Thank you. Today, I'm going to talk about standardized tests. Standardized tests are like friends that pop their heads up once every while just to check in with me. Are you ready for college? I'll measure that. If standardized tests are friends, then that's the longest friendship I ever had. And that is also true for more than 1,300,000 Cambodian students who took the Bakpi National Exam in Cambodia early this November. When the exam season was approaching, my news feed was filled with stress, anxiety, and a little bit of hope. I got curious, so I decided to jump online and check the passing rate of high school seniors in Cambodia by relying on online newspapers such as the Cambodian Daily, the Cambodian News, the Phnom Penh Post, and Fresh News, I compiled this data. There you go. With the exception of 2020, when every senior automatically passed due to COVID-19, the average passing rate of Cambodian students from 2015 to 2023 is 66.19%. This number got me curious again. Is the national exam that rigorous? I decided to look at the national exam itself. I found papers and I analyzed the question. And I saw something interesting. You might want to take a look. This is the math exam in the humanity program that's worth more than 25% of the passing grade. This is the physics exam that's worth about 20% of the passing grade. Ah, and that's the English exam. So the contents on the exam across all these years in their respective subject are similar. Some of them even the same and repeated. But the interesting thing is, Back B National Exam is not the only exam it's not the only standardized test that have patterns. The SAT, the digital SAT, also have a pattern of its own. I look at the four practice tests available on the Blue Book app. I analyze the question, and I connect the question to the resource lessons available in Khan Academy, and this is what I found. In the writing, in the writing and reading section of the digital SAT, the words in context type of question show up the most under the single phrase, which choice most logically complete the text? Then it's the uh, form, structure, and sense type of question, and then the boundary questions. In the math section of the digital SAT, the algebra and advanced math make up 30% of their exam content, respectively. So. Why am I talking about the digital SAT and standardized tests? Some of us, especially those who have taken the digital SAT last Saturday, might view standardized tests as burdens that add, that add unnecessary stress on top of CB, on top of the, the island shootout or rugby tournament, and maybe on top of this upcoming exam season as well. I share this sentiment because I grew up in an education system where standardized tests are the primary ways to evaluate my learning. I once spent 1,000 hours from 7th to 9th grade studying for one single standardized test. Was it worth it? It's too early to tell. 
What I can tell, though, is the effects that those 1,000 hours of studying had on me. I developed good work ethics. I found strategic plan that helped me get ahead of people in competitions. And I became more resilient to wrong answer. So my point is this. As experts are debating the role of standardized tests in education systems, a key idea is missing. The notion that standardized tests can be more than just academic assessments. They can be tools that help us prepare skills that are useful in a workforce such as strategic planning, pattern recognition, and growth mindset. S recognizing pattern is not only useful when it comes to predicting what could be on the BAPI national exam in Cambodia or the digital SAT. It is also a valuable skill in the workforce. Recognizing pattern allows us to predict what could be coming by knowing what you can expect you can make informed decision. In his research, the, uh, an associate lecturer and academic coach, Dr. Ling Daniel, found, quote, a strong positive correlation between pattern recognition and critical thinking. With pattern recognition, it's easier to anticipate problems before they arise, to stay ahead of this rapidly changing world of work, and to challenge yourself to know what skills to develop in order to uh, be successful in the future. So take this upcoming standardized test or exam as an opportunity to develop your strategic notes, your pattern recognition skill that you will find useful in the future. So standardized tests can help us develop pattern recognition skill. It also helps us develop strategic planning skills as well. Your next standardized test, say the SAT, the digital SAT is in January. What do you do? Chances are you've circled the date on your calendar. You've watched YouTube on tips and tricks on how to score high. You've um, maybe used resources available on Khan Academy. You might scroll down Reddits and Quora's for tips and tricks from people who have taken the digital SAT. And especially, you pick up this book, Guide to Your Digital SAT. <laughs> this book includes basic information on a digital SAT, the structure of the test, um, the type of questions that show up on the test, the frequency of those questions, um, useful QR code to useful resources on Khan Academy. And if you're interested in hearing me into interviewing Mr. Dobson, the QR code to that is also in the book. Back to strategic planning. People are different, so what may work for me may not necessarily work for you. You might have a particular way of planning that is unique to you. The practice of taking standardized tests help us reflect and evaluate our own learning to discern which methods are effective, which methods aren't, what our strengths and weaknesses are. Then we can chart a plan that leverages our strength and maybe improve our weaknesses. So people in the workforce might find this idea familiar because strategic planning is part of their everyday work, especially for someone in business. A research by Nancy Upton, strategic and business planning practices of fast growth family firms show that, quote, companies with written business plan grow 30% faster and 71% of fast growing companies have strategic plan, business plan, or similar long-range planning tools. So strategic planning is important in when it comes to benefiting your organization visions, execution, and progress toward goal. By knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are and what kind of plan brings you the highest chance of success, you can be ahead of others. So why wait until you get a job to figure out your the strategic plan that works best for you. Why not leverage standardized tests as a safe platform to develop this crucial skill? So I've talked about pattern recognition and strategic planning. Next is cultivating a, gro a growth mindset. Standardized tests can cultivate growth mindset. 
I know, I know, low SAT score, low Sennonite test score can damage students' self-efficacy, making them believe that they have fixed points on graphs that cannot be improved or changed. The key word here is can. Standardized tests can only damage your self-efficacy if you allow it to. So when you get a low score or an undesirable score on a standardized test, you have two choices. Either retake the standardized test or don't do anything at all because, quote, it's not going to change much anyway. These two choices represent two mindsets, growth and static. In her best-selling book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, the renowned, the renowned Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck defined a fixed mindset as this belief that you are born with a particular set of skills, intelligence, and abilities that cannot be changed. Well, there are many problems with this mindset. It prevents people from taking necessary risks to succeed, it makes people fear challenge and dire situation. Um, and it also fatally destroys people's self-efficacy, no, self-esteem and self-efficacy. So, and growth mindset, on the other hand, is this belief that with work, effort, and perseverance, you can further de develop your natural qualities. People with growth mindset thrive, enjoy healthy challenges, are resilient, grow from, grow from criticisms, and are inspired by the success of, of, of others. So the cool thing about this mindset is that it can transcend beyond classroom wall into relationship, career, and personal goal. Another thing is that you are capable of having, di having this mindset too. All you have to do is step into it. So growth mindset is essential, especially if you want to further improve yourself in the workforce. So why not, so when you do standardized tests, why not do it just to, why, so when you do standardized tests, you have to remember that whatever your score may be, they should not be fixed numerical metric that defines you. Instead, they should be um, roadmaps that guide you to improve for the better. Even with these potentials, standardized tests aren't without flaws. The primary concern of standardized tests is how accurately they measure students' knowledge or understanding. I'll highlight two things, the stress of standardized tests and the perception of socioeconomic advantages that the standardized test results seem to be associated with. Okay, so a research by a research by the National Bureau of a research by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that the stress hormone levels of students spiked by 15% on the week of standardized testing. This spike in stress hormone causes physiological changes such as lack of focus, impaired recall, and damages students' ability to perform tasks effectively. So under these conditions, how accurately can standardized tests measure students' understanding? The concern about the socioeconomic advantages is raised by Zachary Goldfarb in, in, oh, in the Washington Post under an article titled, How These Four Charts Show, these four charts show How the SAT Favored the Rich educated families. In this chart, there's a positive correlation between students' family income and their SAT score. On average, students from family earning less than 20,000 US dollars score 388 points lower than students from family earning more than 200,000 $200, dollars, US dollars. And in this other chart shows that Shows, also shows a positive correlation between SAT score and the student's family, ed, and the student's family education. Generally, students from family with a graduate degree score significantly higher than students from family who didn't graduate high school. 
So I brought up this question of socioeconomic bias in my interview with Mr. Dobson. You can scan the QR code in the book to listen to that. What I got out of this conversation is that the new SAT is trying to move away from its tie to socioeconomic advantage, advantages by removing sections that people believe are reflective of this advantage. Also, College Board has partnered up with Khan Academy to provide useful test prep resources that is available to all students, regardless of their income. Furthermore, a research found that students' mindset is twice as predictive of their standardized test score than their, than their demographic or background. So standardized tests remain a complex topic with valid arguments on both sides. However, we can use standardized tests as more than simply academic assessments. We can treat them as tools that help us create, that help us build, um, that help us develop pattern recognition, strategic planning, and cultivating a growth mindset. Data arguing for and against standardized tests seem to show us as passive participants on a fixed dot on their graphs. But we don't have to be that way because we are individuals who can think for ourselves and who can make the best of our situation. So as we engage in this discussion about standardized tests, let's remember that we, especially high school students, have the power to leverage these tests for our personal growth and success. Thank you. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Oxford all originally started off as seminary schools and schools of theology. In 1647, before America's independence, the Old Dolder Satan Act law was passed. Now what this act ensured was that the younger generation was learning scripture. So as towns began to grow, places that had more than 50 households were required to appoint a teacher over the students. Getting an education was defined by learning how to read and write scripture. As time progressed, curriculum advanced and new things were incorporated into the syllabus, but the heart of education still remained religion. For instance, they used a New England primer to educate their, uh, their students on the alphabet, and it included Calvinistic principles. Schools like Harvard would require mandatory scripture readings for their students, and they would require their students to engage in religious discussions at least twice a day. This continued for years. However, in 1951, the Brown versus Board was passed. Now what this did is it outlawed segregation in the public school. Desegregation is a biblical idea. However, many Christians at the time were against the idea of inclusion. So their response to this was to establish private Christian schools. Now, around 10 years later, in around 1962, public education and religion were separated. The main analysis that I draw from the separation of public education and religion is that teaching only Christian knowledge goes so far. If you aren't teaching the heart of the religion, which is a relationship between man and God, you're missing the whole point. Intellect is only a third of love your Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So, false doctrine and understanding was what laid the basis of private Christian education. So it is vital amongst the body of Christ to continuously analyze it and call it to reformation in order to preserve accurate thought and truth. According to the Christian philosophy of education, the purpose of Christian education is the directing of the process of human development towards God's objective for man, godliness of character and action. It bends its effort to the end that the man of God may be perfect, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So every Christian is appointed the Great Commission. The Great Commission is essentially spreading the gospel to humanity. Private Christian education is the Great Commission on an institutional level. So now that I've given you a brief history of general American education and the establishment of private Christian schools, I'll begin to analyze the outcome private Christian schools have both in their academic and spiritual goals. It is not uncommon for institutions to be built on unethical grounds, but it is important to analyze its validity based on scriptural texts, especially if it is a Christian institution. To start off with its academic side, a study was done back in 2012 based on the influence of both public and private high schools. And this included family structures as a variable. And what the study showed was that students who came from non-intact families who reported, highly, who reported high levels of religious commitment had significantly higher academic achievements than other adolescents who weren't religious. Another study also included that students in general who had the highest measured level of biblical literacy greatly outperformed students who did not. And this trend wasn't just exclusive to private Christian schools, but to any schooling environment and student in general. Private schools in general almost always outperform public education. In 2010, College Board posted the fast distinction between test scores of public and private education. Even in our school, our test results from 2022 indicated that we out had a common trend of outperformance in language, math, and science compared to the US average and the East Asia Region Council of Schools. In addition to present day um, success, academic success, this is also a trend that is noticed in history. It is a known fact that historically, some of our greatest thinkers and scientists and activists came from religious and Christian backgrounds. We have men like Isaac Newton, who created the laws of gravity and motion, Robert Boyle, who created the laws of gas and pressure, and Galileo Galilei, who was the first to report telescopic observations and invent the microscope. We have women like Corey Ten Boom, who hid and smuggled Jews during World War II. Harriet Tubman, was who was known as the Moses of her people, being the conductor of the Underground Railroad. And Rosa Parks, who fought for equality. So in summary, Christian environments and Christian educational environments are fostering capable, in many cases, excellent, peop excellent rigorous people who are changing the ground on which they walk on following the biblical principle of hard work and being diligent. It is true that private Christian schools was first established on the grounds of being anti-desegregation, but unironically, we stand in a present day international school. And this shows the progression of thought and accuracy to biblical principles. So after analyzing a bit of the academic side of private Christian schools, the next question I ask is are they meeting their fundamental goal and purpose, which is to cultivate a generation and a student body of students who know Christ? To analyze and research into this question, I started off by looking into blog posts written by ex-Christian school students, and I took their thoughts and ideas postgraduate, and I began to create interview questions, and then I brought those questions to our campus. I went around interviewing students who came from di diverse beliefs and backgrounds who had been attending the school for more than three years, which means they've been consistently attending Bible classes for more than three years. I wanted to see if I could create a generalized argument to see how we were doing in terms of meeting our goal in encouraging our student body to know Christ. In the end, I concluded three main problems. The gospel problem, the problem of religion, and the problem of community. So the first problem is the gospel problem. Now in the Bible, during Jesus' ministry, he tells his disciples over and over again that not everyone presented with the gospel message will understand it in its simplicity form. Later on in 1 Corinthians, it says, 
that none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Now, the idea that not everyone presented with the gospel message will understand it in its simplistic form raises a troubling concern. Furthermore, when we look at the concept of the, uh, the Great Commission, which is to spread the gospel message, we have to look at its effectiveness in institutions who claim to, um, who claim to embody the Great Commission as part of their purpose. So I went around asking students, what is the gospel message? And I had a variety of answers varying from common biblical ideas like laws to Jesus' life to more accurate ideas like forgiveness. But rarely anyone recited to me the concept of Jesus paying the price so that all could live. Any institution that claims to thoroughly educate their student body on a particular concept, in this case religion, has to ensure that their students thoroughly understand the main heart of it. From a Christian perspective, learning biblical texts and principles without knowing the heart behind it is undermining what Jesus did on the cross. Thankfully, if the problem is just misinformation or lack of focus, then the idealistic solution would, to be, would be to stress its emphasis and analyze to see if students truly know. The second problem raised was the problem of religion. Now, this is a problem that states that religion is destructive. This is a problem that is shared in secular media along with a few non-religious students at our school. This is a problem that says that Christianity as well can be destructive. Looking back at history, we see trend after trend of how religion, in many cases Christianity, was used as a way to justify destroying and conquering. Even in recent days, we see headliners of continuous pastors or religious leaders being accused of horrific crimes. This is a problem of duality, the problem of the title Christianity being placed over sin and immorality. Any person who has a conscious awareness of good and evil has every reason to hesitate or to avoid any ideology that seems to be preaching immorality or duality. The problem with this, though, is that it's unauthentic to the genuine faith. And the other problem with this is that there's a lack of conversations from the people who are practicing the faith. The Bible agrees on this. In Matthew, it says, Jesus is saying, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Heretical teaching, which is a false practice and doctrine of Christianity, should be addressed in Christian spheres. It should be addressed in discipleship, in mentorship, and in the classroom. Right now, the loudest people about the duality of Christianity are those online encouraging deconstruction when this problem was first noted and addressed by Jesus. It is important to address the hurt Christians have done in the past and present, and it is also important to do this because it promotes accurate theology and the ability to distinguish between true and false belief. Additionally, it is also important to address the benefit the church has done hand in hand with addressing heretical teaching to show that the outcome of accurate living is contrib it does contribute well to society. Pew Research has shown that people who consider themselves highly religious reported feeling happier, contributing more to charitable services and serving more, and as collectively had better family lives. The third problem raised is the problem of community. Many students on campus felt as if they lacked community that nurtured their faith or that they lacked godly influence. The biggest factors that contribute to this are staff, parents, and students. Contrary to the postgraduate world, parents and staff have the biggest influence on their students. Additionally, they have the privilege and opportunity to mentor and disciple students. 
Teachers are encouraged to display their faith in the classroom, demonstrating the distinguishment between a God-loving educator in pursuit of their stu students compared to secular counterparts. The Bible stresses the importance of community over and over again. We see this in the very nature of his ministry with the disciples, and we see this in verses in Hebrew that ends with, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. If community, discipleship, and mentorship is important in growing a relationship with God, then that needs to be nurtured and prioritized in these environments. If staff and parents have the desire to see students know God, then they should pursue them accordingly. This is a call for all believers, but an expectation for those covering the students. To trace this back further and to truly analyze the problem raised by students, I ask myself the question, can dry torches light fires? Adults who are encouraging and strengthening other adults, adults will have a zeal produced that leads to action. In Matthew, it says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It takes humility to pursue. It takes love and desire to pray. And it takes action to have a response of action. In, in Second Chronicles, it says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. A land healed is the heart of a great commission. Therefore, it should be the heart of private Christian schools. In summary, like any institution, there are areas of growth and reformation. As a whole, private Christian schools, including our school, is exceeding greatly in academics. And upon critical analysis, do have some places where they can reform and change. Every Christian sphere is called to a level of analysis and truth. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. We have another three students who are going to be presenting on different topics tomorrow. Um, if you're interested in AI, we have two different presentations on that. And if you're interested in aging, which all of us should be because we're all doing it, um, we have a very interesting presentation on that as well. So we hope that you'll join us um, tomorrow afternoon for those. Thank you and have a good rest of your Tuesday.